Hello and welcome. This is the Saluki Games Cast for Monday, March 14th. My name is Justin Young. I'm a faculty member here in uh, the School of Communication Studies at Southern Illinois University at Carbondale. And joining me again are Alicia Utech. Hey, Alicia, how are you doing? Doing well. How was your spring break? It was very relaxing. I needed it badly. <laughs> Do anything exciting? Yeah, I went up to Chicago, spent some time. My best friend from home flew down, so we did all the touristy stuff. We got the chance to wander around. It was pretty cold, but it was nice. And where is home for you? I'm from the Twin Cities area in Minnesota. Oh, okay. So you're used to the code. Oh, yeah. All right. Uh, Ryan Frills, welcome back. Thank you for welcoming back. I, I see you're doing well. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need to check in on that this time? <laughs> No, no, I'm, I'm fine. Um, all right, Ryan, um, how was your spring break? It was good. I got, I mean, a lot of it was just getting grading done, but I got some time in with video games and anime, so that's always nice. All right, we'll get to the video games later, but what anime were you watching? Uh, Future Boy Conan, which I'm watching because I'm writing about Steven Universe for homework, and uh, that's one of the shows that was a major influence on it, so... Future Boy Conan is this is it <laughs> Conan seems like it must be related to something is it related to Conan the Barbarian no, or anything I mean maybe there's like inspiration for the name but it's about a little boy that like has been living on an island in like a post apocalyptic world um with just his grandfather but then he they realize there are people living outside the island cuz a little girl who's escaping from some people from a country called Industria um, comes across the island and her, like, trying to escape, and then, like, she gets caught and captured, and the boy, boy vows to save her, so it's about, like, his adventures trying to help and save her thus far. Is this at all inspired by Wonder Woman? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, okay, I can see where my, from my description it sounds like that. I don't think so. Okay. Um, I know it's based on some, uh, based on a book I'm not familiar with, but. Okay. Well, it, it seems like from the description, like a gender re uh, reversed Wonder Woman, at least the film. Um, there's not like an island of like a bunch of people. It's literally just the kid and his grandpa. And he's like kind of superhuman, but not like Wonder Woman levels or anything. Okay. And OJ Duncan, how are you? I'm doing all right, Justin. How was your spring break? It was okay. It was not nearly long enough, but I think everyone can agree with that. Uh huh. What a mood. <laughs> the mood. But the sooner you get back, the sooner the semester is over. So that's, uh, that's fair, I guess. That's one positive way to spin it, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, my spring break was pretty good. I got to get home and see some family and friends. So that was uh, very much welcomed. And I am happy to be back in that my explanation I just gave. The semester <laughs> is over sooner, the sooner we get back. So i um, ready to get uh, into the summer. But before we get to all that, we're going to talk about some video games. So let's start off with the news. Um, this first story I just thought was really kind of interesting. Um, Elden Ring, which does not have a quest log, so it doesn't keep track of what you're doing in the game, like most role-playing games, most open-world type games would do. Um, that's part of the design principle for the game, that it's supposed to be mysterious, it's supposed to like not hold you by the hand and everything. So I know there was a big Twitter fight over this of whether that was good game design or not. Well, one fan has taken it upon himself to develop an app for iOS called Shattered Ring. Um, and that app helps you keep track of NPCs and side quest. It's three dollars on iOS. I don't think there's an Android version quite yet, but maybe if, if it's successful, they'll port it over to Android. Have you ever used an app to uh, assist you in a game in any way? I have not, but I've seen a lot. I've watched a lot of like randomizer videos, and I've seen how people like have the trackers there. And for me, I feel like it's just a quality of life thing. Like, if you want to make the game more difficult, then you don't need to use that. But I'm glad that it's out there for a quality of life improvement for if you are trying to just have an easier time and not drive yourself insane trying <laughs> to remember what happened over here and X, Y, Z, but suddenly it's Q and what on earth is going on. So I like that it's an option 
that's there for people. I, you know, the three dollars. I kind of wish it was free. I'm sure there's a free version out there somewhere that's maybe equal quality. I can't speak to that, but I think it's a nice thing to have. Yeah. Anyone else? Well, I've never used an app, but I've used plenty of like checklists um, that I printed out. But I, I, it feels weird for, to me paying for it rather than just like looking through a walkthrough and writing down a checklist. Because like in EverQuest, there's, there used to be really long quest lines and you had to mark where you were because there was nothing that told you where you were in it at all. So I always had checklists for that. But paying $3, it, it doesn't seem like that much. But like if I paid $3 for every game that I needed a checklist for, that would that would be a lot. Mm. Yeah, this reminds me of, what was it called? Microsoft Glass, which was Microsoft's um, second screen initiative during the 360 era, I want to say, where, um, you know, smartphones and tablets were just taking off in popularity, and the idea was that they would sort of offload some of the game onto your tablet, so you would have a tablet open next to you while you're playing the game. It was sort of the... You know, the whole idea behind the DS, right? Having two screens is better than one. You can manage your inventory and do things like that. Mm -hmm. So it seems like we're getting back to that with this app, which seems kind of weird because uh, Microsoft Smart Glass seemed to, like, die Mm -hmm. (laughs) very quickly. Um, So it's kind of a weird idea to think that we're back to doing that with games again. Mm -hmm. Um, Microsoft is supposedly planning an E3 style event for June, uh, E3, the in-person event was canceled this year and there's been rumblings of them trying to do something virtual, but nothing's going with that. Um, do you watch E3 traditionally? Has that been something like you would watch these like announcements of, uh, new games and everything? And do you miss that with E3 gone? Normally, I just watch highlights, if we're being honest. I don't watch the whole thing um, because generally anything I want to know is going to become big anyway, um, like the news for it. Agreed. I, I usually just, like, look specifically at the trailers, maybe a little bit of, like, the presentation if I want um, for a thing. I don't, like, you know, I'm not really interested in everything they talk about necessarily. I just watch, like, find whatever few Nintendo things or niche things that are of my interests going on, and then I'm like, okay, I'm done. Right. Yeah, I think similarly. I've I don't think I've ever watched a full E3 presentation, but I'll go and watch the highlights and you know, if there's a certain piece of news like I remember when they announced Mega Man for Super Smash Bros, I think I watched about 1700 reaction <laughs> videos <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> as well as watching the trailer about 2000 times. So similarly, I'm much more of like a highlight reel kind of person for E3. Oh, you got to go back and watch some of those classic presentations. Um, you know, I'm thinking of, was it Ubisoft, one that was hosted by Jamie Kennedy, um, which some of those are just classically bad. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was that sort of era when they were realizing that these presentations, because E3, a lot of those presentations in the early days were sort of, um, you know, a state of the console sort of presentation. So they would talk about things like, sells numbers and you know units moved and shipped and all that and they really were obviously not meant for the general public you know because e3 and all those sort of trade shows were really for selling to retailers to get them to buy your games and systems for the new year and uh when they start trying to switch over to make them more you know, accessible to the public and everything, it was very clear they didn't know how to do that early on. And so it was like, let's bring in an entertainer and we'll have this person get up and do comedy. But the comedy is going to be kind of bad and it's going to be awkward (laughs) for everyone involved. And so um, some of those are really worth watching the whole thing if you can make it through. Um, You know, it's like (laughs) the worst episode of The Office you can imagine uh, uh, playing out, but it's real. Um, but yeah, so, you know, that's traditionally been a big time of year for video games, for announcing new games and all that E3 kind of out of the way. There's kind of a void there that everyone seems to be scrambling to fill. Um, there's the summer game fest from Jeff Keighley. Uh, he's done that the past couple of years with, you know, mixed success for it and everything. And of course, 
you know, I think a lot of companies like Nintendo and Sony are just doing their own thing. That seems to be what Microsoft is signaling here. Um, so it'll be interesting to watch if you're if you're into video games and, you, and you, why are you listening to this podcast if you're not? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so third story up is that the Switch was the top console seller in February. I don't feel like this is maybe too much of a shock because they still can't get enough PlayStation 5s and Xbox Series Xs into stores to meet demand. Uh, but this has been quite a run for a Nintendo with the Switch. Um, you know, this system is, what, now four years old? Five, five years old? Yeah, and five years, and it's still the top-selling console on the market. Um, you know, I'm not surprised after that Nintendo Direct um, because, like, Earthbound, Portal 1 and 2, and the new Kirby game, like, all look amazing. If I didn't already have a Switch, I probably would have bought it after last month's uh, Nintendo Direct. Yeah, between all that, all the good Pokemon content coming out, like, there's just all kinds of stuff that is going to be on the Switch that, again, I'm very grateful to have one now because it's going to be a lot of money on those games, but it would have been even more money to buy a Switch. Yeah, yeah they've been really on top of their game. And, like, even if, like, you're not one of the people that, like, these are my favorite games, like the newer ones, you're still at least interested. Like, I know people that aren't, like, Breath of the Wild isn't my favorite, but it's really cool what they did with it. Oh. Mm-hmm. Um, and... You know, OJ, what you're saying about, like, releasing, like, the Earthbound games, and then also just the ingenious move of, like, making the console also the handheld system. Like, just, Mm -hmm. we're not going to sell you separate systems. This is just all in one. Mm. Yeah, and, uh, you know, when people are pinching pennies right now due to inflation and gas prices, the Switch as a one-in-all system seems to make a whole lot of sense for a lot of people, I think. Um, EA has delayed their Dead Space remake into early 2023. Any Dead Space fans here? So I was a pretty big fan of the first one, um, and I played the second one. I can't remember. Is there a third one? I think there's a third one. that Yes. I I don't think I played the third one. Um, But I really, really enjoyed the first and the second one. I just fell back from playing video games for a while, so that's why I didn't play three. Yeah, I mean, the first Dead Space is a a great horror game, Mm -hmm. um, and I think part two kind of even pushes that a little bit further and everything, but um, the trailer, and that's all they've released so far of this, you know, it seems to be capturing that atmosphere very well. Um, So I'm interested to see what that game becomes Mm -hmm. um, because EA seems to... Yeah, they moved away from doing those sort of single-player focused games for a while, and this seems to be part of their effort to get back into doing those, along with, uh, was it Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order? Um, in, uh, in much tougher news, um, we're going to pivot and talk about uh, the conflict between Russia and Ukraine right now. Um, you know, obviously... This is very somber. Video games in the grand scheme of things don't matter compared to the loss of life and the loss of, um, you know, just the homeland of for many people. Um, but video games do tie into this, and there are some stories related, you know, to video games with this. So uh, we'll go ahead and start with the top one, which is that Sony, Microsoft, and Nintendo have all stopped sales of their consoles and games in Russia. So they're not shipping any more consoles to Russia. They have shut down their digital storefronts. So if you are in Russia, you cannot buy games for any of those systems. Um, Along with that, sort of in response to that, and also to um, Netflix and other streaming services stopping their services to Russia, uh, Russia has basically openly said, hey, it's okay with us if our people pirate your content which does not seem like something that's going to um, build goodwill with those companies long-term. So um, I was talking about this actually this morning in a class that this is kind of a a complicated thing because it's really kind of a PR issue for these companies. So on a very basic level, right, nobody wants to be the last company still doing business with Russia. Mm Mm-hmm. 
um, that looks bad, right? Even if the sanctions don't directly apply to your product or what you're doing, nobody really wants to be the last company out the door. So people are kind of rushing, you know, um, obviously uh, Coca-Cola and Pepsi and Starbucks and all these sorts of companies have pulled out. So it makes sense that these companies would also pull out. The other issue is that the ruble, the Russian currency is basically worthless at this point. So this is sort of a PR move covering a business move. And the business move is that we don't want to sell our games for a currency that's worthless. Even if we can charge you a billion rubles, like what does that translate to? And we're not doing currency exchanges. So, you know, it it makes a whole lot of business sense for them. It's also a good PR move. Um, You can argue that they're also doing it for altruistic reasons, but, There are certainly very practical reasons they might be doing this as well. Um, You could make an argument that it's more altruistic that Nintendo has delayed the Advance Wars reboot. Advance Wars 1 and 2 reboot camp, which was supposed to release on April 8th, has been indefinitely delayed, pulled from their release calendar. Um, If you're not familiar, Advance Wars is sort of in the name, is a a war tactics uh, game. And you are driving little tanks around and blowing up cities and everything. And that kind of maybe looks bad to release Mm -hmm. during the middle of a major uh, world conflict. Um, Any Advance Wars fans? I haven't actually played them. But um, I did want to say something you mentioned in class today, too, is that the the first Advance Wars, I think it was, uh, got delayed in Europe and Japan because of 9-11, because it released in 9-10 in the U.S., and then it got delayed uh, in Europe and Japan because of 9-11. So they seem to not have very much luck with their release dates. (laughs) Yeah. Um, It's sort of like the Horizon games for PlayStation. They release a new Horizon game, and then we get Breath of the Wild a week later, (laughs) and then we get um, Elden Ring a week later. (laughs) So um, sometimes there's nothing you can do about controlling release dates and (laughs) world events. Uh, GSC Game World, the Ukrainian developer behind the Stalker games, and specifically Stalker 2, which was supposed to release this fall sometime, has halted all development. Uh, They posted a statement on their website which said uh, they will um, pause development until, quote, after the victory. Um, So basically they have stopped all development while this war continues on and everything, which, of course, makes sense. Uh, They need to do what's best for them and their safety and Obviously, their sovereignty in that case. Um, but Stalker 2 was supposed to be a pretty big release this year for the Xbox. So that is a game that's off release probably for the rest of the year. There's probably little chance that game comes out this year. Um, multiple studios have also made donations to support the Ukrainian people. Um just a handful, note it here, there are more, so I'm not intentionally leaving anyone out, but Raw Fury, Bungie, CD Projekt Red, um, all have made donations in support of the Ukrainian people. So, um, you know, kind of a, a dark story to get into, uh, but, you know, I think it's important to understand that, you know, video games... Uh, the real world affects the video game world, right? We play video games often to escape the real world, but sometimes you just can't. Um, And that's kind of sad. I know there's also some stories out about some streamers that are based out of the Ukraine that had to flee. Um, And, you know, so we wish all those people the best um, and hope that this conflict ends as quickly as possible. Um, there's no easy way to transition away from that, but we'll, we'll try our best. I thought this was kind of a fun story. Um, it's not big news, but I thought it was really interesting. So there's a streamer by the name of, and I hope I don't butcher her name too much, Amira Virgil. Um, and she plays The Sims, The Sims 4 to be specific, And she learned to mod the game because as a black woman, she was disappointed with the skin tones that were provided in the game. Um, She said that 
a lot of the skin tones looked sort of flat and sort of drained of life and everything. And she really wanted to see more vibrant skin tones in there. Um, and I thought that was just really kind of fascinating. That story's from The Verge. Um, if you want to read more on it and everything, or you want to find out about downloading that mod, um, you can find it there. It reminded me of a story that we recently had the anniversary of, which is uh, Mike Micah, a game developer. Um, his daughter was playing Donkey Kong and wanted to play as Pauline, the character that usually as Mario you're trying to rescue. Mm -hmm. So he modded the game so that she could play as Pauline and rescue Mario. Um, so I wondered, had you ever played a video game and wanted some sort of mod like that? Not a mod to fix the game, like we usually think of them, but a mod just to make a game um, fit some need of yours personally better. Yeah, I've used a lot of uh, I use Skyrim mods to make it more queer because video games are just so heterocentric. Um, I never feel represented. So I've used a lot of mods in Skyrim for that. And I, there's not really an excuse for developers to not have, like, fully fleshed out, pun intended, um, <laughs> like, skins <laughs> for, <laughs> for, for users. So in The Sims, I know that um, I think Elden Ring uh, was getting some flack for not having good hairstyles for uh, black men, right? So, like, there's no excuse for video game companies not to have this fully fleshed out by now because it can be done, so it should be done. Well, especially something like The Sims where, you know, even people who don't play video games still know The Sims. Mm -hmm. And it's been such a big thing for so long. Like, that's awesome that this fan was able to mod it to do that, but it's also really disappointing that they didn't already have it done by the fourth game. Mm -hmm. And that feels like such a, like, a awful example of a game to not, like, represent, like, people of various, like, racial identities. Like, really, The Sims doesn't, mm -hmm. like... I mean, it's bad for any game, obviously, but just a game that's centered around, like, having a house full of people and friends and family that's just really... Disappointing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, OJ, how do you make Skyrim more queer? So, uh, not that I think Skyrim's super queer to begin with, so I'm, I'm just wondering, like, <laughs> what are you changing in it? So, the biggest mod, I think, that that happened was I can't remember what it's called. It's been a while since I played Skyrim. Um, but there was a, um, a really, really hot male vampire that I, I modded to put in the game that followed me around, uh, and helped a lot. So that was, that was how I did it with Skyrim. And in a lot of other games, there's generally mods to change the love interests that happen. Okay. Um, so some games like Mass Effect two and three had, the uh, had like, um, like gay, uh, love interests, um, but there's nothing in one, I think, that happened. And you had to do specific stuff in one um, and have it carry over to get the love interests in two and three. So um, more games need to have more fully fleshed out love interests if they have a love interest. Okay, that makes sense. Um, all right, moving right along, Gotham Knights has been delayed to a new October 25th release date. Um, any fan of the Batman games? Because I absolutely love the original Arkham Asylum game. I think that's one of the best games of its generation. It is, if you've never played it, it's basically a Metroidvania, but with Batman. Um, and even the sequels are, are very, very good. Um, I don't think they're quite as good as the original because they lack that sort of Metroidvania angle to it. But... Um, I, you know, I've been very excited. A new Batman game, that sounds very exciting to me. Anyone else? I am looking forward to this a lot. You know, these are ones, again, I haven't played them because money, but as a lifelong Batman fan, I've loved seeing, like, how well these games portrayed the characters, how much everybody loved them, and correct me if I'm wrong, Gotham Knights has, like, Jason Todd and... Tim Drake and all that too, right? Right. It's Batman has gone missing, and it's basically the Bat family. So it's Nightwing, it's the Red Hood, it's um, the new Robin and Batgirl, I guess. It's the fourth one. I think there's four characters. Yeah, so that looks absolutely amazing to me. You know, I would love to be able to play this game. I don't know if I'll be able to because money, but I will definitely be watching Let's Plays of it. Like, I think it's going to be great. 
All right. And uh, we talked about on our last episode the newly announced Twisted Metal series. And in the meantime, since that episode, Sony has announced another new series, a God of War series for Amazon Prime this time. Uh, The Twisted Metal series is coming to Peacock. Um, But this will be God of War for Amazon Prime, and it's being developed by the producers of The Expanse, which is a very beloved science fiction show, um, very critically lauded. So, you know, this seems like they're putting some real talent behind making this show finally. Um, And I listed off here some of the other shows, other movies and everything that are in development. It seems like it's, I guess, depending on how these turn out, a golden age for video (laughs) games into film and television, or maybe the worst time ever. (laughs) um, I guess we'll see. Uh, So HBO is doing a series of The Last of Us. Uh, The Uncharted film obviously just came out. Uh, I guess that was back in January that that released. That was beginning of February it came out, I guess. Uh, There's a Ghost of Tsushima film coming out. There's a Fallout series at Amazon. There's a Mass Effect series at Amazon. There's a Super Mario film coming out this Christmas, I believe. And and the rumors have been that we'll get a trailer soon for that. But the big news that Alicia was very excited about is that we got a new Sonic trailer for Sonic 2 uh, just this morning, I believe. And um, Alicia... what do you think of our new Sonic trailer? That movie's, what, three weeks away? So coming April very 8th soon. Cannot come fast enough. <laughs> okay, so the Sonic movie, the first one, obviously, the first trailer was a disaster. It was awful. But the Sonic movie was one of the, is one of the things That's that That's the gives- trailer where they had to go back and change all the computer effects because people reacted so negatively mm-hmm. to the look of Sonic. Exactly. Cowards. It was horrifying. <laughs> But the fact that they listened to fans and went back and redid it and changed the look of the entire movie, that to me is a sign, you know, you mentioned we're either in the golden age of video game films or the worst time ever. That gives me hope for being closer to the golden age because the first Sonic movie then turned out to be amazing. You know, was it full of plot twists or anything difficult to call? No, but it was a fun family film that looked great. And now the second one not only looks great, it has so many more references to the video games. You know, in this newest trailer, you hear his ringtone is one of the original game soundtracks. Um, They have the, the person voicing Tails is the same person who's been voicing Tails in the games for a while now. Knuckles is back to being an actual badass rival. It looks amazing, and... I am very excited for this movie. <laughs> we can tell. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll say that I watched that first Sonic film. I went in with extremely low expectations for that film, and I found it perfectly entertaining. It was like the kind of Saturday night movie, turn your brain off and just enjoy it. Um, nothing amazing. Like, from my perspective, it's okay from other perspectives if it was. But, you know, perfectly entertaining. And I completely get why kids would eat it up, right? Like, seemed like the perfect kid movie and everything. Um, So, yeah, this one looks good, too. And I kind of like that, you know, they've got Jim Carrey back playing Dr. Robotnik. And he just seems to be hamming it up even more in the sequel. Like, he seems to be throwing himself completely into it. Yeah, and I think, like you said, the first one is a great, you know, just popcorn film. You sit down. It, you don't have to think too hard about it. And I, th- I think that this one will also be, you know, I don't think it's going to be like the Batman film in terms of writing. But it's not meant to be, you know. I think, <laughs> you don't think Sonic's going <laughs> to have black eyeliner on? <laughs> that whole emo thing. Yeah. <laughs> no, wait, that'll be when Shadow comes in. <laughs> but I, I think it's really good that, it's just a fun, light film, and at the same time, I think it it's good it's good entertainment, not only for someone just walking in looking for a good 
popcorn, shut your brain off kind of movie, but also has so many Easter eggs and nods to fans that as a fan, you can watch it. It's like the early Marvel films. You watch it as a fan of the comics and you're, and you catch all the little things and it just makes you so ha- much happier. Mm-hmm. And yet if you're not a fan of the originals, you still go in and you watch it and you have a good time and enjoy it. And I think that that's something the first movie did pretty well. And I think the second movie is going to do even better with that. Yeah. Anybody else excited for the Sonic movie? I haven't had a chance to see the trailer yet, but I did see the poster and the poster looks like the po- the poster for the game Sonic 2 when it came out. And so I thought that was pretty awesome. Yeah. They're mimicking the cover art mm-hmm. from yep. uh, Sonic the, uh, the Hedgehog 2 for the Genesis. So yeah, there's something kind of fun in that. Of all these shows and everything that we just mentioned, shows and movies, is there one that you're most excited for? I'm going to give you three guesses for mine. <laughs> <laughs> is it Mass Effect? <laughs> I'm going to say I'm excited for Mass Effect. Um, I'm very not excited for Super Mario Br- Brothers trailer. or for I haven't seen the trailer, but the movie, just because the first movie was so bad that, like, what Everything Super Mario movie? We don't talk about the Super Mario movie. That's why it's so great, too. I love that garbage fire. Like, earlier I was about to say, I almost wish they kept the older Sonic design because it was such a beautiful garbage fire of, like, just how not to do it that I almost, I just kind of wanted to see them go through with it and just see what that final monstrosity would, like, come to be. Um, I, I have an appreciation for that Mario movie. It, it's awful, yes, but that's the fun. It's such a... A weird movie. Like, it's the sort of movie that you think today that could never get made. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. you would never take an IP today as big as Mario Brothers and just make something that insane from it. Mm-hmm. So, like, Alicia, you were talking about, like, comic books and everything. Like, we used to get comic book movies that were just, like, wild fever dreams of somebody. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, it was like... They had heard of Captain America before, but never read a comic. <laughs> they and, saw one picture. Right. That was it. And we used to get movies like that, and we, we don't get those anymore. And, and yes, that's for the best, I think, broadly. <laughs> um, but there is something very charming about the original Super Mario Brothers movie where it really felt like somebody had had a, a, a five-year-old describe Super Mario Brothers to them. <laughs> and that was all the knowledge they used in both the writing and the production design of that film. That is the most redeeming explanation of the original Super Mario's <laughs> film that I've ever heard. <laughs> uh, I mean, but you watch it and you go, um, you know, you're watching that movie and you're thinking, okay, a five-year-old is explaining this movie to somebody and saying, yeah, so they're, there's two guys and they're brothers and they fight turtles and there's <laughs> dinosaurs and you know, they have, they have rockets and you're like, no, they don't. But a five-year-old would just randomly throw that in there. And that's the way that film feels when I think about it. I just like the idea that somebody like got the video game thought, okay guys, let's make a movie about the video game, but it's more like Blade Runner, but even sadder and dingier looking. And- <laughs> It would have been more accurate if Bowser had been like Barney the Dinosaur. (laughs) Still in that Blade Runner-esque world? Yeah. (laughs) Great. (laughs) I would pay money for that. (laughs) Um, Yeah, I mean, I'm kind of interested in this Twisted Metal show just because I think that's the one I can least wrap my head around how you make that into a show. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, there's no plot. All the rest of these are fairly plot driven. I guess Sonic and Mario aren't so much, but they're cartoonish. <laughs> um, but Twisted Metal, like there's no real plot to those games. So it really kind of intrigues me how they're going to turn that into a TV series. Um, well, what I'm thinking about is like the movie Rat Race where they had all the people start in Vegas and they're like, hey, you're going to get all this money if you make it to this other place. So I assumed kind of like, it would be something like that is what came to my mind. So a cannonball run for the yeah. 21st century? Yeah. yeah. Man, why don't they just make another cannonball run? I know. Right? That, would, that would be great. And I have, like, no knowledge of those games. My first thought was, like, something like Mad Max Fury Road or mm. something. That would make sense, yeah. It, they'll never make it that good, but... <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, man, if they did a, a twisted metal game or twisted metal movie directed, um, um, directed by him, I, I, I would definitely watch that. I'd be in the theater day one to see that movie. <laughs> um, there is also a, so there's a statement that the rock made, I believe it was on Twitter where he said he was in negotiations to be in one of the biggest video games, uh, another video game. Cause he's already done. Was he done? He's done at least one because he did Rampage and he was supposed to be in a movie. He was in Doom also. Doom, yes. Um, and he was supposed to be in Spy Hunter. They were supposed to be a Spy Hunter movie that never got made, so they made a video game of it instead with The Rock in it. Um, but people have been speculating what property that might be that he's going to star mm-hmm. in. And God of War seems like a perfect fit. I don't mm-hmm. think it's probably God of War. But he would make a really good Kratos, wouldn't he? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Um, Are we sure he's not Bowser? <laughs> <laughs> That's Jack Black. Yeah, <laughs> as we have all wanted. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, him voicing Bowser, that's actually pretty good casting. Like, casting <laughs> The Rock as Bowser would be pretty entertaining. Get, what is it, Chris Pratt is voicing Mario? Right. That'll be, that's the team up of the year. <laughs> Can you smell what Mario is cooking? <laughs> <laughs> Should have just cast Mario with The Rock. <laughs> I, I think this movie could be redeemed if you, like, cast Jay and Silent Bob as Wario and Waluigi. <laughs> oh, my gosh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> that is uh, strangely fitting, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Um. <laughs> I hope that the casting directors are listening to this podcast episode. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like had that movie been made in the early 2000s, that would have been the casting of it. <laughs> so um, Sony held a state of play last week and announced some games. So let's run through those real quick. One was Exoprimal. Exoprimal is a dinosaur shooter, um, but the best part of that entire trailer is that in this world of Exoprimal, there's a weather forecast for when dinosaurs are going to randomly fall out of the sky and attack <laughs> the city. And it is the most insane-looking premise, at least, for a game I've seen in a while. Um, Speaking of the Super Mario Brothers first movie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that really does kind of feel like it's a much brighter version of that universe, right? Um, some people thought that this film, or this game, excuse me, I'm still thinking about movies. Uh, some people thought that this game looks an awful lot like Dino Crisis, mm-hmm. um, which was Capcom's, um, during the PlayStation era, was their series that was sort of a takeoff on Resident Evil, except with dinosaurs. Um and there seems to be some heavy hints that it's set maybe within that universe, but uh, I guess we'll see if it ties in anymore. Uh, Forspoken uh, had a new trailer. It's also been delayed to October 11th. It's a sort of um, Connecticut and King Arthur's court. It's um, a woman from modern world falls through a portal into this fantasy realm, and she has crazy RPG powers for some reason <laughs> in this new world. Um, but that was one of the games shown off. They showed off Gundam Evolution, which was an Overwatch character-based style shooter. Uh, this was, to me, the game of the show, this next one. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the Cowabunga Collection. 13 Ninja Turtle games from the arcade, NES, Super NES, Genesis and Game Boy, um, all in one collection together. Um, anybody else excited about this, or am I the only Ninja Turtle fanatic? So I, I, I'm a massive fan of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, but I will still randomly have nightmares about the NES one in that water level because it was just <laughs> the so, dam. Yes, the dam, and I like. Oh, I was just I was traumatized by it, and I I I know that sounds like a big big thing to say, but like I had nightmares about it for a long time, just trying to beat it so often I get to the place and then just die right there. And it was horrible. So I don't know if I can play the rest of them because that game (laughs) is in this collection. You've been scarred. Yes. Uh, So did you never play like the arcade game? Oh, I did. I did. But having them all together, like it, 
Like, like I know I'm going to have to go past it. It is going to be calling <laughs> to you. Yeah. Like you slay me, OJ. <laughs> right. Oh, you can. Oh, you can beat me now. You have like 20 years experience of playing video games now, and I know that I won't be able to. We believe in you. I oh. don't believe in myself. That's okay. We have enough faith for all of us. <laughs> Whenever I go back to NES games, my general reaction is, how did I ever play these back then? Mm -hmm. I'm so terrible at them now. Yeah. So I I just assume I would be much, much worse at that NES game today. Mm -hmm. Uh, They showed off Giga Bash, which is a kaiju brawler. So think, um, you know, Mothra and uh, King Kong and Godzilla Mm -hmm. uh, destroying a city while fighting one another. Um, kind of looked like, um, oh, what is the name of that game? Um, was it King of the Monsters? Mm-hmm. Is that the yep. SNK series? Um, looked a lot like that. Looked very kind of neat and fun. So um, one of the more stunning games was a game called Trek de Yomi, or Yami. I'm not entirely sure on the pronunciation of that, but it's a side-scrolling black-and-white samurai game, um, which looked very eye-grabbing. Um, and then Square announced two other games, the Diofield Chronicle, which is a tactics, uh, sort of like Final Fantasy tactics, moving along a grid and everything, attacking enemies, and Valkyrie Elysium. Um, I've got to be honest, all these Square games just run together for me <laughs> nowadays. <laughs> I feel like all of Square's games are exactly the same. Even the Final Fantasy games often just kind of run together for me. I don't know why that is. I used to love their games. I used to love role-playing games like that. But seeing these games, if I had not gone back and checked which was which, I couldn't have told you based on the titles at all. Um, and one final bit of news. It's also kind of a bit of sad news um, to report. But uh, PlayStation had some women come forward and accuse them of uh, sexual discrimination. That There had been no further allegations for about the last year. And just within the last week, eight more women came forward saying they had been victims of sexual harassment and discrimination while working uh, for the... PlayStation group of companies, I guess I should say. It was different uh, offices around the country and everything, but under that big PlayStation banner. Um, You know, this is kind of following up on the stories, obviously, with Activision Blizzard, uh, their internal problems with sexual harassment, discrimination, and, you know, many other companies within the game industry. Um, So this is uh, obviously very kind of sad to see, but it's good that people are speaking up and coming forward so that maybe some action can be taken soon on these sorts of things. And maybe the, the industry can be cleaned up as as well as possible, hopefully. Mm-hmm. Um, all right. Not to transition from a very dire note to something more kind of uplifting and happy, but let's talk about what we've all been playing over the last two weeks while we've since our last episode. Um, And one of the big things I know that we all got a chance to play was the new Kirby demo. So this is Kirby and is it, and the the forgotten Forgotten land. Land. Mm -hmm. Uh, This is the new Kirby switch game. It's where he has gone fully 3d. Um, So what are your reactions having played the demo, which is three levels long? I really, really enjoyed it. Um, I wasn't expecting to enjoy it as much as I did. Um, I thought the action was was really good for a Kirby game. Um, I appreciated that it had um, it showcased, I think, four abilities um, that you could absorb and then three of the mouthfuls, um, the mouthful mode things. So I think it was really awesome. It's a fun game. I If I hadn't played the demo, I don't know if I would have bought it, but I'm definitely buying it now as soon as it comes out. Yeah, I th- I also had a really good time playing it. You know, I one of the things that I've really appreciated as you know looking at games from when I was a kid versus games now is I appreciate the incorporation of an easy mode mm-hmm. <laughs> because I'm I'm not great at video games. I just have fun with them, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and so it was really nice that even in the demo they had okay you can play the more intense version or you can mm-hmm. play the easy mode, 
And so getting the chance to do that, and I thought the the soundtrack is great. The game visually looks really good. It's easy to play, I think. You know, none of the controls are too wacky and like, wait, why is it this button to do mm -hmm. that thing? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I really enjoyed the demo. I am looking forward to the game a lot. Yeah, it's not a whole lot of buttons on the mm -hmm. controller. Like it's mm -hmm. two or three buttons, I think play the whole mm -hmm. game and or at least those first three levels um so yeah it, it is a very sort of paired back control system so i think it makes it very accessible mm -hmm. um certainly to little kids but also to adults who maybe don't play a lot of video games mm -hmm. um yeah i i really enjoyed it i um it's not like i mean it's still like a very fairly linear game it wasn't maybe quite as open world as i was hoping it'd be I mean, I didn't expect it to be super, like, big open world, but, like, I I almost don't mind it just because, like, the world that you do get to make and explore, it's just so, com you know, it's just, like, so well-designed and rich-looking um, and just, like, in its, like, cartoonish flavor. And I like the strange juxtaposition of Kirby and what looks kind of like a really colorful, pretty post-apocalyptic <laughs> world. <laughs> um, and something I was, like, enjoying was thinking about, like, so I study animation, um, and I was just thinking about how, like, I mean, I know video games and animation are, like, their own categories, but they incorporate animation. I was just thinking about how Kirby gets back to, like, that, going back to, like, the old cartoons, like, those rubber hose-style cartoons, like, from the 30s um, and stuff. But, like, how, like, Kirby really captures, like, that plastic nature of them, like, this with his, like, super malleable body. Whether you're just thinking about his ability to, like, eat somebody and, like, then all of a sudden spread up a hat and a sword. <laughs> or to just, like, you know, the whole mouthful mode that they're now doing, which is really leaning into that. Um, so just, like, thinking about it, like, in its design in relation to, like, animation history was just kind of neat. Um, yeah, it's almost like a, a 3D cup head in that <laughs> way, right? Yeah. Like, that's borrowing from those old animation styles and everything as well. Um, yeah, and it was also cool to see, like, little details, like... The first time that Kirby does mouthful mode and he swallows the car, you know, you get that kind of blink moment where even he's like, what? This is new. <laughs> okay, we're rolling with it. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Ryan, I kind of had the same reaction early on playing the game that I, I kind of thought this would be more open world, kind of, you know, like a Mario game. So open level, I guess, not a fully open world. I wasn't expecting Kirby Elden Ring. Right. So <laughs> how you download your $3 app to <laughs> <laughs> keep track of where you are and what's happening. How amazing, though, would Kirby Elden Ring be? Somebody's got to make <laughs> that mod, uh, speaking of mods. Um, but I kind of thought the levels, it, it's much more kind of on a guided track, almost like a, a Crash Bandicoot is mm -hmm. what I kept coming back to yeah. and thinking of. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I'll say that when I played the first level, I was like, oh, no, no, Nintendo, don't do this. And it really started to feel like one of those overly simplistic Nintendo games. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, like some of the... Um, uh, Yoshi's uh, Crafted World, I think that's the title of that Switch game, where it, it's perfectly fine and everything, but it, it feels like it's made for little kids, and I mean mm -hmm. real little kids, right? Um, and that was my reaction after the first level. And then as I got into the second, particularly the third level, it opened up more. There was more gameplay, more variety, more challenge from the enemies mm -hmm. the boss at the end of the third level um I, I should note i was playing it on the hard harder mode mm -hmm. i don't know if i'd call it hard mode exactly yeah. <laughs> um but like there was some actual challenge there you were mm -hmm. actually having to think about what you were doing um and so i really ended up liking it at that point um so by the end of it I, i'm kind of like you oj it wasn't a game that i was super interested in other than i thought it looked really neat mm -hmm. But by the end of that third level, I was like, no, like, this is a game I kind of want to play more of. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I really want to do more with this game and everything. So, um, you know, I guess in that way, the demo worked. Mm -hmm. It did exactly what it was supposed yeah. to do. I just, I wanted to also just say, I really like the monster design for this. Like, I like those turtle monsters with, like, the building shells. Yes. Like, mm -hmm. it's just, they look so cool. And I, I mean, I love giant gorillas, like, so, like, just having the giant girl. Although I didn't want to fight him because I liked him, but. 
It's just it was a cool looking boss. Like I just the creature design in it and just the little furry I can't remember what they're called, but the little furry fox things. Like I don't want to mm-hmm. fight those entirely because they're so adorable. Like Goomba, I don't mind stepping on a Goomba. Like good, get, go away. <laughs> but like these things, I'm like no, don't don't hurt them, Kirby. No. <laughs> well, they're depicted so cute and cuddly mm-hmm. and. When they're showing them up close, when they're capturing the, uh, what are they, Tweedledees? The Waddledees. Waddledees, <laughs> sorry. Uh, I'm thinking Tweedledee and Tweedledum. Um, <laughs> so the Waddledees, when they're capturing them and they're showing them capturing them up close, they're both so fuzzy and mm-hmm. cute and everything. So you kind of do feel bad. When I, when I have a sword and I'm attacking those foxes, I actually feel bad about right. it. And they're like <laughs> sleeping under a tree. And you have to attack him or else they're going to come after you. It's just, it's horrible. Yeah. Kirby's the true villain of this game. <laughs> um, that's how it feels. Like, that's how I felt in some of those parts when I was attacking him under a tree, right? I felt like, should I be doing this? Like, am I going to, I felt like it was going to be uh, one of those games where you have an alliance over the course of the game, like you're good or mm-hmm. evil and it shifts over the course of the game. Mm-hmm. And I felt like I was lowering it by attacking <laughs> those foxes. It's like Colonizer Kirby just coming in God. and <laughs> kill, killing all the native inhabitants. Just wait, we'll get a po- we'll get a pacifist mod at some point. <laughs> King DDD was right. <laughs> <laughs> that was another thing, though. I really appreciated in the preview video at the end of the demo. Like you can see, like something's going on with DDD there. Yeah, and you know, obviously that conflict's not a new one. The conflict between Kirby and Meta Knight isn't a new one, but mm-hmm. it's always fun to see what they do to make it different. Mm-hmm. So I'm really looking forward to how the game continues to expand the storyline mm-hmm. once we get the full game. And that footage was new. I don't think that mm-hmm. footage had ever been in trailers mm-hmm. before. And it, yeah, I don't think we'd seen King DDD at all. Mm-hmm. And it, it really showed a lot of uh, more variety of gameplay. Some of the more mouthful mode sort of things that you do in the game and everything. Uh, the one that excited me the most when I saw it was the one where you absorb the roller coaster mm-hmm. and are going around. And I just thought, well, that looks stupid, but also like incredibly <laughs> fun. <laughs> so um, there was a, the, the character. I can't remember uh, what the name was, but right at the beginning, the, the new character that's your friend, the blue one. And I thought it was Carbuncle for a second. I was like, oh, it's going to be Final Fantasy coming in <laughs> with Carbuncle. But um, that was not the name. I can't remember what it was. But yeah, so everyone positive on Kirby. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, let's talk about some of the other games uh, that maybe you've been playing over the past couple of weeks. OJ, what have you been up to? So I, after playing the demo for Kirby, I was like, you know what? I wonder what other demos are out there. And then I saw that Final Fantasy Stranger in Par- or Stranger of Paradise oh, no. had a demo. So I downloaded it. <laughs> and I am so disappointed. I... Like I'm, I'm gonna play it through to the end of the demo. It's very expansive. Like I'm already past um, the the pirate town. I can't even remember what it's called. Um, but I so it's 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 a pretty big demo. But I am not at all happy with the fighting system. The targeting is horrible. Mm-hmm. Um, the classes that you can go through are are not bad at all. But and this is this is. I'm so upset at this that, like, I don't even know if I can put it into words correctly. You can only have three characters at a time. What? In a game that is based off of four heroes that are holding crystals, you can only have three at a time. That's weird. Which, you know, kind of made a little bit of sense in Final Fantasy XV. But if you have the four heroes of light, how can you only have three of them on the battleground at once? It's ridiculous. And I kind of miss like having an overworld thing because you just, there's, there's a map with the different like towns and areas that you do do stuff in. So there's no overworld and it just seems it's not good. And we should state that this is uh, a sort of side story to final fantasy Mm one, a prequel, I believe is. not it? No, it's, it's a, it's kind of a reboot. It's like a gritty reboot of the first one. Okay. Um, So it's followed the same, the same story so far or mostly the same story but yeah you start with three characters and then right at the beginning where you would normally have fought garland you fight someone who's kind of a personification of chaos but then it ends up being your fourth person so you have the four and you can only 
oh, I'm just so upset. <laughs> See, I, I've been interested in like some of like uh, Square Enix's like projects outside of Final Fantasy lately, but mm-hmm. it sounds like Final Fantasy has been kind of a mixed bag for a lot of people lately. Mm-hmm. Like I wasn't so excited about some of the things I heard about on 15. Mm -hmm. Um, I saw like Super Eye Patch Wolf is a reviewer I go to and he did a huge critique on why it kind of was like a giant like fall like in for the series. Mm -hmm. I've heard mixed things about like things that are really good but also things that are really bad about the 7 remake. The main Mm -hmm. thing I'm interested in right now honestly is like triangle strategy. Mm -hmm. I like the 7 remake quite a bit. Yeah. Um, Okay. But uh, yeah. I can understand why it would turn fans of the original game off, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So I I think it's a good way to approach a remake and that is trying to do something new with the material. Um, But I can see it turning some fans off. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the issue with the Final Fantasy VII remake is two things. I I understand why they're doing the episodic downloads, but that means it's going to take 40 years for us to get the whole game. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing was, like, it was such a big deal to have it released on the PS4, and then immediately the PS5 comes out, and now you can't mm-hmm. get Intergrade on the PS4. You have mm-hmm. to have a PS5 for it, you know. Mm-hmm. It took us, a, my sister finally got a PS5 after a year and a half, mm-hmm. so we can finally play that, but mm-hmm. it's, I don't know, I love the original, I love Remake, but I mm-hmm. definitely can see where, like, there are some valid critiques. <laughs> right. yeah. And I'm not, like, I know you guys said you love. I'm not. I haven't played it, so I can't say it's bad. Mm-hmm. But I'm just. That's what I heard. Is like, I think I heard like the same reviewer say like there's things he absolutely loved about it. Like in terms of like gameplay, mm-hmm. there's things as far as like storytelling goes. He was like, uh. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I can completely see that perspective on it. Mm-hmm. Uh, anything else, OJ? I, uh, I'm just so disappointed. <laughs> I'm gonna buy it and play it anyway, just because I'm <laughs> such a big Final Fantasy nerd. <laughs> But I'm very disappointed that I'm going to be spending 80 bucks to buy it and the season pass. Wow. I, I really like this masochistic <laughs> approach to playing video <laughs> games. I'm hoping maybe they'll fix it and make it so you can have four people at some point. If not, I, I'm just mad. There's hope. <laughs> uh, Ryan, what have you been playing? Um, so, I mean, first off, I just finished AI. The Somnium Files was the main thing I did, which I... I mean, all my theme things still stand. I absolutely love that game. Still, definitely some cringy humor. I, you know, like, we talked about, like, some of the sexist humor. And also, like, uh... This is about, the visual novel style game. Right. Um, and also, just I want to also add another warning to anybody who might hear this and be, like, interested in, like, playing this. Like, um, there is a awesome nine binary character in it. And they do have, like, some statements in the game that's, like seems fairly in defense of the LGBTQ community. There's also some cringy humor around the LGBTQ community as well. So yeah. um, take that for, I mean, a lot of people won't be surprised by this. Like a lot of like Japanese pop culture artifacts can like, some of it can be really good, but some of it can have like a really weird relationship with that stuff. So I'm not saying anything um, new for a lot of people, but like it, you know, just keep that in mind if anyone else choose to get it. I love the game overall, but. Anyway, moving on. The new things I've done. What was the title of that again? AI, The Somnium Files. They're okay. actually releasing a sequel this summer, which I'm excited for. Okay. Um, and the new, the new to me anyway, I haven't, I had, in terms of I had never played them before, was things that I played was, aside from Kirby, was I started playing Quake recently, um, just because I always had been curious about that one as a kid, but never got to play it, so I... Played it, and I had a lot of fun with it. Um, it I see why it was a big deal then. I don't think it's like my favorite game right now necessarily. I see why it was a big deal then. But I had a lot more fun with it when I started seeing it more as a puzzle than a straight-up shooter. It's mm-hmm. like, okay, I need to move through this environment in this way. I need to stand in this place and do these things at this time. Um, like, I think I started having a lot more fun with it. And I was starting to do better at it than I expected to because I was... The controls are good for that time, but they're just so smooth and slick that it's like I move. It's almost too sensitive, it feels like, at times. I'm like, whoa, what just happened there? I didn't mean to move from one side to the next that quickly. Um, But I've been enjoying it. Um, The other thing I tried and started playing, because I've always been kind of curious about it, was Hollow Knight. Oh, Um, yeah. So Metroidvania games are games I've always been interested in more than I've ever, like, enjoyed them personally. Like, I've been trying to find that. Like, I think that they sound interesting in theory, I've been trying to find that one that clicks with me, and I think this is the one that's clicked with me so far. Um, Because I've tried other ones before that I I saw why they were great, but I just wasn't quite getting into them. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but I just, I love the world building of this. I love kind of the slow burn of kind of like figuring things out about it. Um, I love the aesthetic that I'm um, just kind of like this dark, almost Tim Burton-esque look to the animation. Um, and it's just, I, you know, I, I like those, I like worlds like that are built around like little like forest critters and stuff, in this case, insects. Mm-hmm. Um, and them and the idea of like exploring like this old civilization uh, type feeling. So it, it, I've just had a lot of fun moving that around, learning about that world. Um, so that's been the, those have been what I've been playing. Yeah, and I think that's a Hollow Knight's a really interesting one because that's been a very, in my experience, talking to people has been very much a polarizing game. Even people who are Metroidvania fans, like they either bounce off of it extremely quickly or they love it and they will proselytize that game as like one of the best games of the last 10 years. Um, so that's really interesting uh, coming to it as somebody who hasn't really connected with the Metroidvania games to connect with that so quickly and everything. It's a game I bounced off of very quickly and I keep wanting to go back to it. I feel like I should because people I know and like and respect their opinion have really loved that game quite a bit. So um, maybe at some point I'll get back to it. Right. And I haven't even had like a bad experience with other Metroidvania games. I just, I never clicked. It was never Mm -hmm. like super excited. This one, I was like, the next day, like, after I first tried, I was like, I want to play that game again. Yeah. Um, uh, Alicia, have you been playing anything other than Kirby? Yeah, so other than Kirby, I finally, my copy of Pokemon Legends Arceus finally arrived mm-hmm. after a week of being told it had arrived, and then it didn't. Mm-hmm. Turns out it was put in my neighbor's mailbox. <laughs> Thank goodness he knocked on my door and gave it to me rather than keeping it for himself. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, but so I was playing that with my boyfriend last night. And I, right now I have kind of mixed feelings. You know, I feel like the tutorial portions are too long. Like we're not really that far into what I feel is the actual game. I'm intrigued by the story decisions, you know, right off the bat. it I had assumed it was okay, you're just in this other region and, you know, it is the past and that's what you're doing. But right away you're like, oh, yeah, like your character fell through a space-time rift that everybody just casually knows is there and doesn't know what to do with. I was like, oh, okay. (laughs) So our character is, I guess, a modern protagonist who is familiar with Pokemon and suddenly ended up in this world and is (laughs) less confused than I am. (laughs) But I'm in... Really enjoy the gameplay. I think there's a lot of nice touches in that, you know, not only the characters who you battle have names, but also just the random NPCs around town all have names. And so you're able to kind of get to know each of the characters, not just the main ones who you can see, oh, yeah, like this is the ancestor of Cyrus from Team Galactic, and Mm -hmm. we've got the Diamond and Pearl clans, and everybody keeps talking about Almighty Sinnoh, (laughs) and... Yeah, I think it's doing some really interesting world building. I do wish that the t- that the gameplay tutorial sections had moved a little faster, but I'm hopeful that we're past that now, and I'm excited to keep getting into the game and playing more. That's a complaint I hear often from Pokemon fans, that each new Pokemon game puts you through the same tutorial, even if you've been playing Pokemon games for the past 30 years, that you're still having to go through these same tutorials over and over again, and that for a lot of people, that's incredibly frustrating. They wish there was a just skip the tutorial section. Well, and I think it's valid to have a tutorial section in this game because they have changed up a lot. You know, they've changed the catching system. They've changed the battling system. They've changed, okay, you know, now you get missions and you can do side quests and pick up requests from NPCs. And they've changed how you develop the Pokedex. So there is a lot of changes that even as someone who, you know, Blue version was my first video game ever. Mm -hmm. And so I've been playing Pokemon all my life. There still was stuff that you need to learn how to do differently in this game. But I think it could have been more compressed. Mm -hmm. You know, we played for 45 minutes to an hour, and I feel like we're barely... I feel like we spent the majority of that time on tutorial missions. Mm -hmm. So, like I said, I wish that that was a little more compressed. I do like the new mechanics of, you know... You can use strong style moves or agile style moves and 
again, these open world aspects, the side quests, the NPCs actually having personalities beyond just the professor and your rival and that like all the random village people have personalities, which is pretty neat. Mm-hmm. But I, I'm excited to keep going and to get further into the game and really get the plot moving. All right. Sounds great. Um, and for me, other than Kirby, because I've been traveling, I haven't had a chance to play a lot, but I did get into a game called Vampire Survivors, which sounds like it's going to be a very RPG game. Um, and it's not, it's a a purely action game and it's a game I have a whole lot of trouble explaining. So it is a roguelite. Um, so you are doing runs each time and you start over from the beginning, but between runs, you can upgrade some abilities. So you are getting stronger the more that you play the game and everything. The actual gameplay is sort of a, looks like a dual stick shooter. So it's from a sort of overhead perspective, looking down and you're shooting enemies with your different abilities. Uh, The enemies themselves are all taken basically from Castlevania games. So you're shooting skeletons and zombies and the two-headed dragons that shoot fireballs at you in Castlevania uh, all like literally look like they're ripped straight from a Castlevania game. They're not, (laughs) but they certainly are uh, leaning heavy into that aesthetic. But you don't actually use a second stick. In fact, you don't use any buttons in the game. You just use the one control stick. It auto fires. All of your abilities are on a cooldown. Um, so, for example, you might get axes that you can throw. They will automatically throw, um, but they're on a cooldown. So, you might throw one every five seconds or something. You collect experience with the enemies that you kill. You power up all these abilities. And so you add more axes, they do more damage, they cover more screen territory uh, and everything. And you are basically just trying to get further each time. There's a clock at the top of the screen as you're playing the game. It's counting up the entire time. The first time I played the game, I'd even make it to five minutes. Um, I've gone to 30 minutes now where there is... I won't spoil it, but there is an enemy at 30 minutes that I cannot get past. I believe there must be a way to get past that enemy, (laughs) Um, but I can't do it right now. I should say that the game is early access on Steam, so maybe they're gating it at that point because they haven't finished with the additional content. And the other thing is this game is $3 on Steam early access. Um, It's the sort of game that I'm I'm playing on like a five-year-old gaming PC and it runs fine. It's all sprite basic graphics. So it can run on probably just about any computer I would say. And I think this game is fantastic. I didn't think I would, but people kept talking about it. I gave it a try. I've really, really liked it. It's a great podcast game. And that it's the great sort of game to play while you have something on in the background because you don't really need to give it 100% of your attention, particularly as you, like, start getting better at it. You know, um, that clock is counting up in real time, so a run might take you 30 minutes. After you get pretty good, those first 15 minutes, you're not even thinking about what you're doing. You're just doing it on instinct and everything. Um, it has a large number of different weapons that you can get. It also has modifiers on those. You're upgrading both of those and everything. It allows you to kind of spec in different directions and come up with different builds. Um, it, it's just a really fun game for a $3 game. It, it looks, I didn't check the credits, but it looks like, you know, one person could have made it. Um, it's probably a very small team would be my guess. Um, but they have continued to, to release new levels for it and all sorts of new upgrades to it. They seem committed to this early access. It's the sort of game that I want people to play um, because I think this is the sort of cool little thing that people can do now and get a game like this out of nowhere. And, you know, I've had more fun with this game over the past couple of days than I've had with some $60 games that I've bought. 
Um, so that's called Vampire Survivors. It's on Steam right now. Um, you know, it's not on consoles yet, but though I don't see any reason why it couldn't be ported over to consoles at some point. But uh, definitely worth three dollars. Um, you know, give it some time, and I think you'll really enjoy it. Um, All right, that does it for everything except our big question here at the end of the show. And this week's uh, I specifically came up with to break some of your hearts and ask Mm -hmm. you, who is your favorite Pokemon? Who's that Pokemon? (laughs) um, Ryan, we haven't started with you yet, I don't think. So who is your favorite Pokemon? So I I do actually got a couple answers for this. Historically, and favorite just cool monster design, um, Charizard. I, I know that's like a very cliche standard answer, but it's the big freaking dragon that I could start off with, and that's always been cool to me. And, and and when I played Pokemon Let's Go Eevee, just at the end when it's like you can fly on your Charizard like like anywhere, and just like fly, you know, riding Charizard like over like skylines and stuff, um, it's just awesome. Like just the it was a little thing. It wasn't like a big game-breaking mechanic or anything, but it was just cool to see it finally happen, just me get to fly around Charizard. Um, and that said, I also love his Mega Evolution X, um, which I found out was designed by the... I can't remember her name, but was by the same person that designed the original Charizard design. She went, came back and designed the Mega mm-hmm. Evolution X for people that aren't sure which one. that That's the one that um, is black and blue with like the really sharp-looking wings. Um, love that design. And I guess my favorite cute design is Eevee. Um, I, I I personally do prefer Eevee over Pikachu myself. Uh, but that's it, it just reminds me of some like the little dogs we've had my family's had in the past. I'm come from a family that loves dogs, so that's that's those are mine. Charizard and I also got a warm spot for Eevee. Hmm. All right, OJ. So my favorite has always been Jinx. I just really love her um, ever since the first game. I really loved her, in the, especially with the first uh, cartoon. Uh, she was just amazing. I actually broke the law to try and get a Jinx. Um, so when Pokemon Go came out, <laughs> and it, there were none in I was trying area. to figure out where the story was going. <laughs> <laughs> there were none in the area at all. But when we went to Dallas, we found that uh, we looked on Silk Road and saw that there was a Jinx nest, but it was in the middle of this big building. And there wasn't any way, we went at night, and there wasn't any way for us to get in, so I just went in and snuck in so that I could get a Jinx. That's so, amazing. Yeah, so <laughs> I, 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 I broke the law see, for Jinx. I want to see the hard-boiled noir film based off this. <laughs> <laughs> Detective like, Pikachu 2. <laughs> I risk it all. I'm glad <laughs> you breaking the law was like, the safe outcome compared to like <laughs> some people playing Pokemon go who are right. like walking off of cliffs and into streets and everything. Yeah. So, um, yeah, <laughs> I, I wasn't sure where that story was headed when you said <laughs> I broke the law to get a jinx. <laughs> Somebody listening to this out of context is like, I don't know what's this guy talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I did some dark things for a jinx. <laughs> Dog Day Afternoon with Jinx. (laughs) (laughs) Alicia, favorite Pokemon. Okay, so I also have two. Um, Number one of all time, I think, has to be Togepi. I mean, that was when I was a kid. Obviously, it's adorable. It's fun. You know, you play with a Togepi in the games, and your best move is always Metronome, which you never know what's going to (laughs) happen. Sometimes you get like earthquake sometimes you get growl (laughs) and i'm like i like the unpredictability i like how adorable it is i that that was always the one for me you know watching the show watching misty carry around Togepi. i was like i want to carry around a pokemon it wasn't ash and pikachu being out all the time it was Mm -hmm. Togepi that i wanted um my other one favorite i think also from gen one also because of the anime has to be meowth you know when we were kids my sister and one of our other friends and I would all, my sister and our other friend would always do the Team Rocket motto as Jesse and James, and then little four-year-old me would come in with the Meowth, that's right! <laughs> and so <laughs> from that, Meowth has a special place in my heart. Also, again, speaking to the games, I love that you can use Payday and get more money because money is a valuable resource. Mm-hmm. You need to be able to get those X items. <laughs> so 
I know they're both Gen 1, and I do love a lot of the newer Pokemon as well, especially I think Sinnoh had a lot of really good Pokemon. Hoenn had a lot of really good ones. I guess Togepi is technically Johto, so that's technically Gen 2. But yeah, newer Pokemon are good too, but like I said, Blue Version was my first video game ever, so the Gen 1 Pokemon are really close to my heart. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Um, so I'm going to reveal one of my great shames that at least <laughs> my students <laughs> often think this, which is that I don't really play a lot of Pokemon. So my knowledge of Pokemon often comes from outside of the games themselves. I have played uh, a couple of them, but I'm not a huge Pokemon fan. It's okay, Justin. The first step is admitting you have a problem. <laughs> <laughs> I think that would be if I came in next week with, uh, you know, 100 Pokemon plush dolls. And <laughs> that would be the problem. Um, but anyways, um, I, I'm going to echo you, Alicia. I love Meowth. And I, I have seen some of the uh, anime. So I told you all before we went on the air and everything that I had a roommate in college who was really into the Pokemon cartoon. And I just thought, like... Meowth was the most interesting of the Pokemon. The others were kind of boring in the cartoon. And Meowth <laughs> was this very bizarre character. And there's that episode where they, like, explain why Meowth can speak and the other Pokemon can't. Go west, young Meowth. <laughs> and that episode is so weird for a children's cartoon. <laughs> And I think I just really liked that. I liked that story and everything. Plus, I just like cats and everything. So I thought, well, here's an evil cat, uh, at least in the cartoon. Um, and he has this tragic backstory, which is kind of comical in a way. And, like, this is a fun character. Um, I like that, you know, he was trying to win over this um, female Meowth, right? It's a, it's a female Meowth. He's trying to win her over, and so that's why he teaches himself to speak so he can be high class as a Pokemon. <laughs> um, just a bizarre story, and so that's kind of fun. The other one that I kind of have a soft spot for is Coughing, just because I like it when he says his name, and he's like, Coughing! <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, this is, we ran out of ideas, and like, <laughs> Bill was in the corner of the office coughing, <laughs> and somebody's like, that's a Pokemon. Um, I know there's a Pokemon who's like a bag of trash now. Trubbish. Yeah, and I just like the idea that, you know, the first 151 were like, we really spent time and we thought about it and we thought like, how can you make <laughs> this cute, cuddly character? And then as the series goes on, they're just like, I don't know. Like what's in, a, what's in the office? There's a trash bag over there. Somebody hasn't taken out. Could that be a Pokemon? Hey, and Bill has an ice cream cone. <laughs> it, it just really seems like they're stretching at some point and, there's part of me that, well, I probably should be offended by that. There's part of me that respects it. And <laughs> like they're trying to see how far they can push this and that little kids will still eat it up and everything. And, and adults. <laughs> yes, and adults. <laughs> um, eat up the ice cream Pokemon. <laughs> yeah, that raises a whole other question, right, about are people eating the Pokemon? Yes. <laughs> Slowpoke tails are a delicacy. Okay. People, and the, the original far-fetched Pokedex entry talks about how people capture it and cook it with the leak that it carries. <laughs> so would somebody eat a, a talking Meowth? Maybe not a talking Meowth, but <laughs> they would they probably eat a Meowth. <laughs> yeah, that, see, that, that see like, for them, it, it's like, <laughs> like how people in our world eat cattle. Right, but if if a cow spoke to me, <laughs> I don't know that I could eat another steak. <laughs> but how many people in the Pokemon world have actually interacted with Team Rocket's Meowth? I don't know. The Team Rocket seems to be everywhere, aren't they? Yeah. Team Rocket is, but Jesse James and Meowth aren't. Mm. Oh, well, that's fair. And, like, some Pokemon used to be humans or something, like, so that, that breaks up some. <laughs> yeah. Some yeah. Pokemon used to be humans? Yeah. Some of the ghost Pokemon, anyway, at least. Some oh. of the ghost Pokemon and some of the weirder lore gets into, like, mm -hmm. the English translation in Diamond, Pearl, and Platinum says, like, oh, like, Pokemon and people used to eat at the same table. 
But when you look at the original <laughs> Japanese text, it's like some people in Pokemon used to get married. <laughs> and you're like, um. Ash's mom and Mr. Mime. <laughs> So if someone eats Mr. Mime, is it cannibalism? <laughs> Asking the real questions on the Saluki Games cast. <laughs> this is what it's now going to be dedicated to. Just, it's like asking really weird questions about Pokemon. I wrote a really edgy short story about Pokemon. It was about Lampet because Lampet can like consume this soul and like completely destroy someone's soul. And I had Lampent getting Ash. That was my edgy. Oh, man. My edgy short story. That wasn't very good. It was a creative writing class, but, you know. <laughs> How did the, the teacher respond to this? Uh, I don't think he knew Pokemon, so he didn't really. He was like, care. what an original like, oh, idea. Yeah. yeah. And I was like, oh, okay, that's fine. <laughs> Look at all these characters he created. Right? <laughs> <laughs> he created one that <laughs> just walks around going coughing all the time. <laughs> He's either gen- a genius or insane. I don't know which one. <laughs> it's a thin line. <laughs> <laughs> that is always the danger as a teacher. Is this student actually a genius or just insane? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, all right. Well, that does it for this week's episode. Uh, OJ, Alicia, Ryan, thank you again for being on. And um, thank you for everyone listening. If you have questions, comments, thoughts, uh, suggestions, uh Wait, things you want to yell at us about because <laughs> we chose the wrong favorite Pokemon, you can do that by emailing at justin.young at siu.edu, and I'll pass along those comments to the rest of the um, podcast group. And um, we will be back next week with another episode. So uh, please tune in, and you can obviously subscribe to this if you're just listening to it. You can subscribe on uh, Google, Apple, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. So thanks for listening. Thanks for tuning in. Have a good week. Play some Vampire Survivors. We'll see you next time.